So, this is one of the few people who needs almost no introduction. <laughs> His name is Yuko Katz. You know him from pretty much every core team in the open source universe. <laughs> I believe he has more gists than any other human being on the planet. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, Yehuda has worked on a lot of different frameworks, so he is uniquely qualified to talk to you about, um, well, framework development. So, uh, take it away, Yehuda. Thank you. Hello. So first of all, thank you everyone for coming to GoGuruko. Um, I've been involved in GoGuruko for a few years, and um, what's kind of ironic about this talk is that I was one of the people who pushed very early on for the 30-minute uh, talk, 15-minute schedule, 15-minute uh, break schedule. So um, on the grounds that I think you can pretty much say anything you need to say in 30 minutes. So I guess here I am speaking for an hour, um, and I always find speaking for an hour to be a little bit difficult, and you may or may not see why. Um, but so uh, Josh asked me to speak here, and I said, you know, I've done a lot of frameworks, like Josh said. I want to talk about um, framework development versus app development, because I've done some app development recently. Uh, and the more I thought about the topic, the more I realized that there isn't really a framework development and app development thing. There's more of a framework development mindset and app development mindset. Uh, there's the way we think about things when we're building applications and there's a deadline tomorrow and the deadline matters a lot more than the code quality. And there's another thing that we think when we're building something for someone else to use, um, we can spend as much time roughly as we need to get it done. And the most important thing is that all of the downstream users from us can actually get done what they need to get done. Um, so I thought I would talk about uh, sort of framework development and app application de framework development and application development more from a perspective of how I personally think about what I'm building when I build things. Um, and like I said, framework development and app development is a spectrum. Uh, all of our first apps are all, all the way on the left side of the spectrum. We're literally just thinking about how to get something done. Uh, you watch a blogging 15 minute video and you copy and paste, right? Or you type in, um, if you're lucky. And that's sort of all the way on the left side of the spectrum. You're, you live in the moment. And the right side of the spectrum for me has been developing Rails itself. Uh, there's a mil million or millions of users of Rails. Everything I do matters a lot for all the downstream people. Um, it almost matters more to take an extra month to get it right, or two months, or three months, or six months, than it matters to get it out right away. And so that's sort of on the, on the other side. And then I've worked on two projects over the past few years that I, I sort of, I'm giving you a basic idea. So Procore was one of my first professional jobs as an app developer. And we did some stuff. We were, we, it was in the Rails 1X period, so we were, uh, for instance, overriding action mailer to add layouts and helpers were going around at the time. We were doing some, some stuff that you would consider framework development. But actually, we did that stuff pretty poorly. And because we were thinking about things more from a, how do we get stuff done, it ended up, it ended up biting us pretty hard. Um, on the flip side of that, uh, the company I work at now, Strove, um, and Jose, who gave the earlier keynote, actually works with us uh, as a contractor. Almost all the code that we've written, we've written in the same way uh, philosophically as we would write Rails. We're thinking about, we're building an app, and it matters, and there's, people, there's consumers of the app, but we're building the app from the perspective of how do you build loosely coupled modular code. And um, sort of my, my thinking is, I'm not saying that the stroke way is right, or the stroke way is wrong, or the Rails way is right. It's not really the point of this talk. It's just to say that there are really different ways of thinking about it. And I want to talk about sort of what those, those ways are. Um, and one way of thinking about it is that if you build an app of sufficient size, and you build it at all correctly, your app will probably include a framework of some kind. Um, a very extreme example of this is Pivotal. Pivotal has in-house frameworks that they use for things. They're literally frameworks. Um, but even any app of any sufficient size will end up having framework you stuff in it. The way I like to think about it in general is the difference between an application and a, frame, and a framework development is a state of mind. Um, application development, uh, I once heard in college at a philosophy lecture that there's something that we take for granted as human beings, which is that we see ourselves in the middle of a timeline that spans from the past and the future. And all the decisions that we make have to do with what we've done in the past, we think about it a lot, and where we're going in the future. And many, 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 but not all animals don't actually have this at all. 
They literally are just thinking about things in terms of where they are right now. And uh, first of all, that was a little that was like mind opening for me at the time. But second of all, I think that it's very similar uh, duality between framework and app developer. An app developer is very much in the moment, and very little is being thought about who came before you, who came after you, where you're going. A framework developer is the opposite. So an app developer has my code. And there might be other code out there. There is the upstream code, and there might be downstream code. But basically, the way the app developer thinks about the world is there's some upstream code, and the upstream code provides an abstraction. It's a black box. Go to the Rails documentation. That's all there is. And then there's my code. And that's the entire universe. And the way a framework developer thinks of the code, and notice that these are double-sided arrows instead of single-sided arrows here. The way a framework developer thinks of, the, of, the, uh, of their development is, there's my code, but I'm actually participating in the discussion about what happens upstream. If something goes wrong upstream, I want to actually discuss that. If I want to make improvements upstream to help my code, I'm going to work on that. And if I want to, uh, if there's people downstream from me, as, for instance, when I'm a Rails developer, I want to think about how the decisions I make affect the downstream. And they're going to give me feedback, and I'm going to give them feedback, and there's going to be an ongoing discussion. So really the difference is, an application developer, and by the way, please do not get offended, I'm, I'm sort of using these terms as archetypes. Right? I am both, many of us in the room are both, um, so sort of think of application developer and framework developer for the rest of this talk as like a symbol that means the thing I am building up here, and not you or your friends or whatever. Um, so an uh, app developer is somebody who essentially uh, sips from the, the wine of an abstraction. Give an abstraction, you go to API and on Rails.org, that's all there is. A framework developer is involved in the discussion. So when I say uh, you're involved in a discussion upstream, there's actually a few different aspects of this. Um, probably the most important thing is that a framework developer needs to understand the upstream. And that's if an application developer needs to understand the abstraction provided by the upstream, a framework developer needs to understand the upstream. So for instance, when I am doing work on Rails, Ruby is one of my options. There's actually a lot of options. There's Rack, uh, there's Rockets, there's Journey now, Aaron just added. Um, there's a lot of upstreams, but probably the most important upstream to Rails is Ruby. And it's important for me, when I do Rails development, to not just think of Ruby as a thing that provides, a, that provides some abstractions that I'm using, although I like to think about it that way. It's actually very important for me to understand more about what goes, up, goes on under the hood. And if you've done very complex Rails applications over time, you probably realize that that is also true, right? When you think as a framework developer, when you think as a person who's doing essentially what I do with Rails all day, you're actually thinking you need to go understand at least one level of abstraction above you. You need to understand in detail what's going on. And I'll sort of go into this more as I move forward, but I actually think that if you are doing things that are fundamentally frameworky, if you're monkey patching the framework, if you're extending the framework, and you don't understand the abstraction level above you, you're just asking for it. Um, Joel Spolsky has a famous blog post, which is the law of leaky abstractions, right? You have to assume that the abstraction above you will eventually leak. So if you're doing anything other than treating it as a black box, and if there's something wrong, you file a bug, and that's it. If you're doing anything other than that, you need to understand the abstraction above you in terms of implementation. It just turns out to be true. So I want to sort of take it aside now, because one area that I find especially concerning when it comes to Ruby is people's general understanding of Ruby thread. So I'm going to do something now that probably is cheating for this talk, which is give you another mini talk inside my talk about Ruby thread. <laughs> and this is really an example. So you can imagine what I'm doing right now is uh, Shakespearean play within a play. Right? I'm giving you an example of something where there's actually a lot going on under the hood. And when people go and they try to do something different than the golden path, they try to say, I'm going to do an alternative to the canonical way of doing things. If you don't really understand what's going on, you end up getting bitten. So I want to explain what's going on to give you a sense of what it is that I mean. Um, so the, most people's abstraction level to threads in Ruby are something like this. Threads are slow. Or they heard that Nova school. So like events are awesome. I should probably use events. And I guess there's a library called the event machine. So that automatically means it's awesome. And it's going to be faster than threads, which are slow. So I should use that. And then eventually, um, because there are people who do understand, like the person who's giving the talk after me, he has a very good understanding of the whole system, Ilya. 
Um, he will start to talk about some, some improvement that you can make as a person who understands what's going on. And soon you'll start to hear people talk about fiber. So we have a bug in the Rails bug tracker right now about somebody using Rack Fiber Pool. And if you, if you read through the bug thing, it's clear the person doesn't actually know what's going on. So they're using a very advanced construct, which is something that you do as a framework developer without really understanding what's happening, right? And this is mainly as a troll for Ilya, who will speak after me, I'm sure he will respond. <laughs> so I want to talk about what a thread is and uh, how Ruby execution works. Uh, maybe you'll learn something. Uh, if you want, you can like, use the bathroom and come back, and I'll continue my talk in a few minutes. Um, but I'm going to start with a very simple program. Right? So we have a little function out there. It's called hello. Um, inside the function, we increase y by 1, then we sleep that, that amount of times, and then we print y, and we say x is 1, hello, and you put stuff. So if you run this program, everybody here hopefully knows that what happens is um, you'll see a pause for two seconds, and then you'll see two on the screen, and then the program will be done. So the question is, what is actually happening? Why does that happen? What exactly is going on behind it? So the first thing that you need to know is that when you run a program, there's actually a structure that exists inside of the program. And um, this structure doesn't always exist exactly like the structure. Assume that everything I'm saying over the next like 20 slides is an abstraction. So Rubinius and JRuby and MRI all implement this in somewhat different ways. But you can imagine that it basically works like this. So there's this thing called the stack. And the first thing that happens is there is the script gets pushed on the stack. And the important thing about each one of these boxes in the stack, which people call frames, are that they have a little dictionary or hash of local variable names and their values. And we can know up front, in Ruby, we can know up front what all the possible names and values are. So in this case, we can look at this code and we can see that the only local variable that's ever used is x. So we start off in the code saying, OK, we have this frame over here. And in this frame, x is used, but we don't know what it is yet. And then, can you see there's a little, like, a little pointer over there? That little blue thing is. Uh, essentially an instruction pointer or an expression pointer or something like that. It's basically where we are in the, in the code. So we start off by saying x equals 1. And when we're done saying x equals 1, what that does is it fills in this little frame over here. It says, OK, x is 1 now. And then we say, call hello x. Hello with x. And what happens then is that we actually create another one of these structures. So every single, when you're in the middle of running a method, every single method has a little structure that has all the local variables and what they are at the current moment. And we also have all the stack, all the um, frames that we're in the middle of, right? So we call hello, and the thing about hello is that since it takes y as a variable, we already know that it's one up front, and then we say y plus equals one, right? So then y becomes two, and then we say sleep y. And the important thing about sleep y is that as soon as you call something like sleep, something very special happens, which is that the VM basically says, OK, we have this thing called the stack, which represents where we are. And there's, a, there's basically a few, a few things that are in play here. First of all, every single frame that's on the stack has a, a list of all the names and the values of the name. right? So the bottom frame still knows that x is 1. The top frame knows that y is 2. And second of all, for every single frame, we know where we're up to, like what part of the code we're up to over there. And what happens when you call sleep y is that we take all of that state and we tell something called a scheduler. We say, hey, don't basically go to sleep and come back to this in two seconds. So in the meantime, you don't have to do anything. I don't care. Come back to me in two seconds. And when two seconds passes, basically, that thing, that magical thing called the scheduler, which is basically God in your program, that thing says, OK, I'm going to continue. And it basically continues as though you were just running the program straight, straight on, right? Then it puts Y, which is going to print 1. And then after it puts Y, it returns. So that stack, that frame in the stack goes away. And then we're back where we started from. We say puts done. We puts done. That goes away. Now our stack is empty. When the stack becomes empty, the program is over. Okay, so that's basically the structure of what happens in the program in terms of the stack. So you probably heard of the term the stack, that's basically what's happening. And the important thing about stacks is that stacks give us a very important thing that we're very used to having, and that if you've used, written a lot of node code, you know is not as omnipresent as it, is, as it is in Ruby. Stacks give us stack traces, right? If something goes wrong at 15 <coughs> levels above the stack, 
because we're keeping this structure, we can say, oh, it happened at line four here, and then that happened at line three in this one, and blah, blah, blah. You can, go, you can figure it all the way back to the beginning of the, of the trace, right? You can figure out exactly what, what happened. The other thing that stacks give us, and that's what I showed you in the previous slide with sleep, is they let you, they let you wait to return, right? So because we have this stack structure and we know from whence we came all the time, we know exactly where we came from, we can actually say, come back to me later, and then when you come back, then you can decide to return, right? Uh, in contrast, if you, how many people have programmed Node at all? So when you program in Node, in contrast, that callback doesn't actually remember the state. So if something goes wrong in the callback, all you have is the thing that called the callback. You don't have, you don't remember the original state, right? So that's basically the trade-off that you're making is uh, callback versus thread, and, and I'll talk about um, what you get soon from callbacks. But in a callback, you lose all the state, you lose the ability to have a stack trace and a decent amount, of decent debugging. Right? If something goes wrong in Ruby, you can go into Ruby debug and you say go off the frame, you can look at the local variables. Right? That's because something in the program is keeping track of all that. In something that's callback oriented, you lose that information. So let's move on and talk about, uh, so that, that's if you say sleep, people tend to not write sleep in their program, but there's something that happens that's very similar that happens with um, I.O. When you, when you try to look things up from the file system or off the top. So this is a simple program, right? We have a method called read, it takes a file, and we say file.read file, that will return a string. Body calls that, and we puts the body. So anybody who knows Ruby should know that if you run this program, it's going to print out whatever is in the readme file. Right? Very simple. Um, so it basically behaves, we have the same thing as we had before. We have this little dictionary that has a, a name of a file name and a body, because we can see that those are the variables we need, variables we will need. So far they are empty, right? We start moving forward in the program, right? File becomes readme. Then we say body equals read file. Now we jump up to the read thing. We say file.read file. Now the thing is that file.read file behaves very similarly to the sleep that we said before small difference. So first of all, the same thing that we said before happens, which is we take, we look at the stack and say, okay, here is the stack. So far there's nothing in the body slot over there, file is readme, their file is readme too. We have that stack pointer is there, that stack pointer is there. Okay, we now know everything there is to know about the current state of the program. You take that, you take that um, state and you give it to the scheduler. Except this time, instead of saying, come back to me after two seconds, you say, come back to me when there's anything ready to read in the file. And if you've programmed any node code, you'll know that this is similar to what you have to do manually in node, where you say, like, file.read, and you take a callback, right? There you're saying what to do. When the file is ready, call this function. In Ruby, what you tend to do is you say, when the file is ready, resume this thread. And, you rem and the thread remembers all the states, right? And the important thing to note here is that that file.read method, when it gets resumed, that's it does all the work to actually get the string out of the file because it knows the file is ready and blah, blah, blah. So once, once the file is ready for reading, file.read will come back, right? It will return. Now body will contain the text of the file. We'll print it out. And now the program is over, right? So basically it works exactly the same way. Um, this is a little bit of overkill for straight line programming because it's easy to imagine in a straight line program where you're not doing anything in parallel that when you say sleep, it's just basically like not doing anything. The program is over. You don't really need a schedule, right? You don't need a program that comes back if you're only doing one thing at a time. But the reason why we have a schedule, scheduler, the reason why we have something that manages this is because what will usually happen, both in Ruby and in something like Node, is that you want to do multiple things at a time, right? When you start reading, waiting for a file to be available, or you start waiting for I.O. to be available on a socket, you actually want to be able to go on and do something else. So what happens in Node is the scheduler says, okay, you have paused to get some I.O., I'll just find another callback that's, read, that's available, and I'll just call it. In Ruby, what happens is we find another thread that's ready to be resumed. So I will show you how that works. So let's look at another program as an example. So here we have the same read, the same read. we set up a directory of slash users, and then we, instead of saying read the file directly, we say make a new thread, read the file, make another thread, read my bimrc, and then puts the value of the two threads. Okay, so this is a simple program. You might not know exactly what happens here, so I'll, I'll walk you through it from a like, Ruby perspective. What happens here is you make these two threads, 
Each of the threads is running conceptually parallel, and value basically block like will wait until the thread is done running. So you can basically say put t1.value, you see that each of the threads returns the reading value. So it will base the main thread will wait, and the other threads will uh, will in parallel, quote unquote, go do the right thing. So let's look at what how it works from the perspective of the stack. So from the perspective of the stack, we have d equals users, right? Then we get to this thread, right? So we're walking down, we get to this thread, and it says t1 equals thread.new. And basically, when we make, when we say t1 equals thread.new do, what we're doing is we're copying, essentially copying the stack over. We're saying, okay, there's a new stack that is looks exactly like the current stack looks here right now. But what we do is instead of saying resume this in two seconds or resume this on this I/O, we say resume this the next time you have a second, which can mean anything, it's basically undefined behavior. And then we move on and we create. T2, which is basically, again, a copy of the same thing. And we do the same thing. We say, resume this when you have a second. So right now, the important thing to note about threads is that there's always one thread that's there. So I'm, I'm assuming MRI is semantics here. Obviously, you have no, if you can run in real parallel, it's different. But let's assume Ruby 1.9 for the moment. Uh, so in, in Ruby 1.9, we always have one active thread, a thread that's actually doing something, and then a bunch of threads where for some reason they're inactive, and it's either because you said get back to me when you have a second, or because you said get back to me when you have some I.O. ready, or because you said get back to me after two seconds, but basically these threads are all waiting for something. So then we, so right now the main thread is the one that's active, right, and so we say puts t1.value, and what that thing says is it says, okay, the current thread, I want you to continue this thread when this other thread finishes, right, so you're basically creating a whole a callback structure. You're saying, come back to me when this other thing is true. In this case, the thing that's true is the other thread finishes. So, since we had some threads that said, come back to me whenever, I don't really care, come back to me whenever, we will, uh, we will make that thread the active thread now. And now, now that thread gets control, and it can do whatever it wants. And now it says, okay, I have a file, so go f equals users read me, right, and then it says read the file, and then it basically behaves exactly like we talked about it before, except it's on its own stack, right? So now, every thread has its own stack that behaves exactly the way we talked about stack working before. So we go read the file, and that says, hey, resume this thread when the file is ready to read. So the thing to notice here is that if you write node code, you're doing all this stuff manually. Every time you do I.O., you say, do this thing when you're, when you're ready. When you write threaded code, you're basically automatically behind the scenes letting an abstraction handle the fact that I'm reading I.O. now, resume this one is ready. So now, T1 said resume this one is I.O. ready. Okay, the main thread is not ready yet because T1 is not done, so now we pick T2. So T2 becomes the active thread, and it does the same thing, right? It goes, you read the file, jumps in here, you say read. Now it says resume this when the file is ready to be read. Now we're in a little bit of a pickle, right? We have three threads that are inactive, and three, the first thread is waiting for I.O. to be ready, the second thread is waiting for the first thread to be finished, and the last one, P1, is waiting for I.O. to be ready. So they're all waiting for something. Um, they're not actually in a situation here that is unresolvable. What needs to happen is that the I.O. for T1 or the I.O. for T2 needs to be ready. So that needs to happen. And once that happens, we're going to resume and move on. Okay, so basically you can easily imagine what's happening here. Um, the important thing here is that threads in a programming language like Ruby abstract callbacks together. If you've written node code, you realize that the thing I just described happening with threads is basically exactly the same thing that you do manually when you do I.O. and node, right? There's, it's just that the call this thing back when you're ready is happening inside of something called the scheduler. And instead of it just calling a function that only has access to its scope, you're calling back a stack which has access to the state. So uh, what's also important to note is that there's nothing fundamentally different about a uh, programming language that has a global interpreter lock like Ruby and something like Node, except for the fact that the callback, the equivalent of the Node callback is saying resume this state instead of the callback saying here's some actual code to run. And remember that the stack state, each of those stacks actually gives us things that we want gives us stack traces when things go wrong. That tells us exactly how we got to the place we got. 
it gives us deferred return. In general, what the stack gives us here is it gives us the ability to pretend like each one of the things that are happening in parallel are happening as a straight line, right? So you don't actually have to, in general, have to think about the fact that things are happening in parallel. Where in callback code, you actually have to spend a lot of mental energy thinking about how the callbacks are uh, combined. Now, the next thing is that fibers, which you've probably heard about, are basically just small threads. So uh, a thread, so we haven't talked about this here but um, yet, but a fiber, a thread obviously, it has this big stack. Well, basically the way Ruby works is that it allocates a certain amount of size. It allocates eight megabytes usually for that stack. And that's so that you have something like 8,000 frames. So you can do very deep recursive stuff. Some people realize that actually you don't really need 8,000 uh, frames all the time. Actually, sometimes you only need a few hundred or a dozen of frames. So essentially what a fiber is in Ruby is it's a small thread that only has 4K worth of stack instead of 8 megabytes worth of stack with some caveat. Um, probably the most important caveat is that before I showed you that when you say file.read, behind the scenes it's like, hey, take this whatever's left and send that to the schedule and the schedule will resume it. A fiber does not participate with the main scheduler. So basically what that means is that when you use a fiber, you have to bring your own scheduler. You have to build your own scheduler. And that's actually the next talk after my talk is about Goliath is essentially like implementing that for fibers. Right? So you, you can definitely do that. Um, but the problem with bringing your own scheduler is that now a lot of code that already exists, like all the database drivers and everyone talks to Mongo and all the built-in file I.O. and all that, that already knows how to talk to the built-in scheduler, the one that Ruby comes with, doesn't actually know how to talk to the scheduler that exists in Goliath or whatever schedule you build for fibers. So now you have to rebuild all those I.O. Right? You have to rebuild all the I.O., anything that talks to I.O. to talk to the manual scheduler, the one you work. And what you get for that, the trade-off that you get for that, is that you get smaller frames, right? So if you have a problem where you're like, RAM is at a premium, I need to have 10,000 or 100,000 users at a time on the same process, and 100,000 users times 8 megabytes, holy shit, that's way too much. 100,000 users times 4K, that seems a lot better. Then that's actually a use case for going through all the pain to redo the I.O. yourself, or, uh, Potentially, if Goliath ever gets really stable and everyone doesn't experience any kind of weirdness, then that would be, uh, then you wouldn't have to trade on this one. But I don't think that that's too good. Um, in general, uh, you can also use something like Event Machine, and then Event Machine, the trade off here is that you get only one frame, right? So a fiber is little stack, thread is big stack, callback is no stack, right? And the trade off here is that because of the fact that callbacks are only one frame, what you can do is you can have a lot of them running, you can have a million of them running at the same time, right? But you can, but you don't have, you don't remember where they came from. There's no information about their state. So that's Ruby. In Node, we have this callbacks are one frame, right? So I, it's cool that Node decided, like, it makes the ecosystem very good at doing callbacks. But what that means is that what you're trading is that you never can have the equivalent of a five word thread Ruby. So Ruby basically gives you three options, gives you big stacks. Little stacks, no stack, um, with the caveat that now we have to have three ecosystems building for each of those options, right? And Node gives you one one option with the callbacks, which gives you no state, no backtraces, no debugging, but with the benefit that the entire ecosystem is working on one type of item. So that's sort of where where the trade-off lives. Um, the reason I went through all of that is that you, as a Rails developer, should not have to know any of that. If you want to be an app developer, you should just have gone to the bathroom and ignored everything I just used. Right? But if you want to under, if you think if you're in framework development mode, if you're thinking about I want to get better performance out of my system, I want to think I, I actually do care about real time systems. I want to do something off the beaten path and have a lot of concurrent users. Now you actually have to start thinking about this stuff, and that means actually understanding. It. And my point is, you you don't you actually cannot get away with saying I'm just going to let someone else build a leaky abstraction for me, and I'll use their leaky abstraction because then we get stuff like people submitting tickets to Rails saying, I'm using Rack Fiber Pool, and it says stack level too deep. Well, of course it says stack level too deep. That's a trade-off you made. You have a small stack. You cannot have a very deep amount of stuff happening on it, right? And then people say, the solution is we need to make fibers bigger, right? No, that was the trade-off we made. We made the trade-off to have little ones, right? Um, people I know who like talk about this stuff made the joke after that. 
um, ticket came out that we should start a campaign to have eight megabyte fibers, right? Because <laughs> a lot of people will think it's a good idea, but it's nonsense, right? So the point is that you get to participate in that discussion, right? That's what I mean when I say framework developers are participating. You get to participate. But if you participate, you have to understand. You have to know what's going on. And I think one, one area of criticism I have for the Ruby community is I think there's a lot of often participation without understanding. So if you want to be a framework developer, if you want to build plugins that go deep into Rails, make sure you understand exactly what's going on. Um, I spent like probably six months with encoding until I understood it very, very well. I get extremely frustrated when people try to solve encoding problems and clearly don't understand it, right? So if you want to help with encoding, if you want to help with threads, please make sure you spend the requisite time to understand what's going on. So where was that? <laughs> That's why you have an hour, you have to get your stuff. <laughs> um, so as an app developer, basically you are going to use the abstractions provided. And just to reiterate, don't try to swap out parts of the stack for performance if you don't understand it. So if we continue, so step one is make sure you understand the upstream if you want to be a framework developer. Step two is what if there's a bug in the upstream? So if you're an app developer, basically you do this. You say, file ticket on Rails, usually by like <coughs> zipping up your entire app and putting it on the phone tracker. <laughs> <laughs> that goes all over really well in the Ruby tracker, by the way. I think in the Rails tracker, we like, in the Ruby tracker, they're like third party code. Um, and usually you're like, you're legitimately saying it's not my problem, right? There was an abstraction, I relied on the abstraction, the abstraction is what I expected. Hello, people who made the abstraction, please fix. I will, in the meantime, move on with my life. And that's what you should do if you treat what's above you as a pure abstraction. That's how you should behave. As a framework developer, you actually want to try to help solve, fix the bug. So um, there's a few examples here. One example is, for a while, there was a bug in Ruby 1.9 that almost got shipped to Ruby 1.9.2, where certain you could have certain gem combinations that got activated, even though they were definitely illegal. So you could have uh, you can say require this, and then you can end up pulling in an earlier or later version, even though the gem said, like, you must be equal to 1.9, then you can anyway pull in 2.0. And that clearly broke, right? That's like no package manager in the world could get away with having a bug like this. So uh, me, Aaron, Evan, a bunch of us found this bug, and um, rather than just say there is a bug and call it a day, you can see there, I made a gem, I think it was called like Ruby Gems Bug, Aaron. Ruby Gems bug child, I like pushed it, described the bug, I was like, if you do gem install, you run into issues, right? And that basically meant, and even with that, it's difficult to get things fixed, right, sometimes. But at least here, it was very clear what the problem was. I wasn't saying, I think there's some issue with Ruby Gems, I don't really know what it is, but sometimes the wrong thing happens. I was saying, here's the exact replication. And again, you can't do that if you don't understand what's above you. Because then all you can do is say, here's the exact replication that I have. In order to be able to do often replications or reduce replications, you have to actually know what is happening. My favorite bug um, ever, you should read this blog post, by the way. One of my favorites. Um, there was a random bug in Ruby that uh, would occasionally raise an exception on two hours. So for like a year, and like the entire Ruby ecosystem was trying to work around this bug, if you tried to like flatten an error, if you tried to flatten an array, and there was an object in there that did not respond to a or y. At random, it sometimes didn't work. So sometimes worked, sometimes didn't work. And basically, everyone in the Ruby ecosystem who was like doing framework and stuff like Rails had retreated into a crash-like position and just stopped using things like Flatten. And it was like we you know, comment in Rails. We cannot use Flatten because there's some weird thing with a or y. Or you would like loop over it and manually check or whatever. Um, and eventually I was like, enough is enough, and I made Evan did all the hard work, but we figured out what the bug was, and it ended up being some crazy thing inside of the C code. That was a one-line path which we submitted and got accepted. Um, but again, if you're a participant, and this is, you don't, you as a Rails developer don't have, this is me, one level up is Ruby, right? You, the, the analogy would be one level up would be Rails. But it took me an entire day, it's very hard, but the bottom line was that it turned out to actually be a very important bug, and honestly, had we not fixed this bug, it probably would still be wreaking havoc to this day, but in wider numbers as Ruby 1.9 got more accepted. So, um, if you are a person who wants to, who's an, essentially, when I say framework developer, I mean like an advanced 
developer in, your, in the area in which you're writing applications. Try to help out. Try, if you understand, try, go do the extra work. Right? Go, go the extra mile. Figure out what's going on. I, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here. Um, and then, if you go beyond bugs, if you're like, I wish Rails did X. Uh, if you want a better upstream, then you don't, the app developer what you basically says, I hear there's a new feature coming in Ruby someday, so I guess like we'll do that, or maybe you like get up and like stop to complain about it. Um, and that is somewhat effective, but what's more effective is to try to implement it, right? So this is the, the patch that Jose and I wrote for the underscore thing that he said, right? And doing this type of stuff will have a much higher degree of likelihood of actually affecting the outcome, right? So we can actually, if you want to feature in, I can tell you from experience from working on a whole manner of frameworky things that accept patches, having an actual patch, not because people are against it or anything like that, just because having an actual patch actually allows us to more easily reason about what it is that is being proposed, right? So if you say, I wish there was partial application, someone submitted that bug to Rubinius or MRI, first nobody would have any idea what you're talking about, and then there would be like a 20, in a good world, there would be a 20 post stream trying to identify what it is that you're talking about, right? If you submit a patch, then a lot of times it won't get accepted, right? But at least it will be clear what's happening, that people are arguing about the specific implementation. That's actually a lot better. So if you are interested, if you're an app developer, you use Rails, and you wish Rails did something differently, it's a lot better to actually try to implement a solution. And I can tell you as a Rails developer, I would prefer a not very well implemented, kind of broken, for sure would not accept this patch solution to test. I would prefer me to be able to look at the semantics of what you're seeing and see a programmatic answer to, to, to the request. So an example of this, another example of this is um, somebody wrote uh, this library called KJIO, the Unicorn Guide, which basically says it's kind of annoying that when you use this method in Ruby called read non block and it would block, instead of it just like not returning anything or returning something to tell you that it would block, it raises an exception. Because then basically you go and you run like Ruby minus D and you select like a million exceptions and all the exceptions are like in NetHDD trying to read and it's like pretty much normal flow but there's an exception. Or um, you, when you actually write the code you have to rescue an exception even though it's clearly not, it's clearly just like I don't have anything to read it. So this guy wrote KGIO which is used in some libraries and it's basically instead of read not block there's try read not block instead of raising an exception it returns a symbol. So it returns a symbol that says I'm not ready yet. And I was like, this seems like a good idea. And I was working on some other stuff, so I actually submitted a patch. Now, I don't know if this will ever get accepted. If you're interested and you actually know what I just said, go like hang out and participate in this thread. It's been going on for a while. But at least I submitted a proposal. If you read the proposal, the thread is all about this implementation, which is a lot better than arguing about whether it's a good idea in the first place. Now, so that's all upstream. Basically, the, the bottom line of upstream is there's going to be a bunch of stuff there. Make sure you understand it. If there's bugs, try to fix them yourself. Try to work on it. If there's new features you want, try to write the code. This is, I'm not saying you have to do this in order to be a developer. I'm saying if you want to be uh, the kind of developer I'm archetyping as framework developer, you will want to do this stuff. In terms of your own code, you want to learn things by reading similar code. So an app developer lives in their own code. A framework developer says, oh, I'm middle of building Rails. I'm going to go look at some other stuff like Rails and see if I can get some ideas. And there's basically three types of things that are like your code. Um, some of these might not apply to app code. The first line is copycat code. So copycat code is actually not that useful to, for ideas because they've essentially already copied your ideas. So there's not much to be said. Usually it's worth skimming to see if there are any genetic mutations in the copying that are interesting. Um, so maybe the language mutation caused some interesting stuff. So it's worth reading a little bit. But it's basically skimming. You skim it. Um, then there's things like structs, which are like sort of in the same space, but they're solving problems so differently that they're really only worth skimming to see if the different approaches that they're using are at all applicable. But sort of spending a lot of time reading through all that code, given your limited time, is probably not worth as much as other things that are in the same space that are solving problems, the same problems, but a little bit differently, right? They're not, they're not copying you, but they're solving the same problem. So, um, if, when, you're think, when you're a framework developer writing your own code, I basically bought, you go to my house to see on my bookshelf, the book for every single framework. There's Rails for beginners, there's Learning Django, I don't know what these names are. Um, and the reason for that is that you get good ideas. So Django, for instance, 
one of the best ideas I saw in Django was um, the way they do validations is they don't do validations on their models, or they hadn't historically. They do validations on a form model. So basically they create a form object. That form object is the thing that make, that is essentially important to form for instead of the model. And then that thing is the thing that also knows validation. So the, the reason why you know this is a good idea is because you, it should be obvious to people that validates confirmation of is not a model concern, right? That is a controller concern or a request concern. It's not a model concern. And the fact that you're putting it on the model is kind of broken. So when you, I read through Django, I'm like, oh, that's a really good idea. That would be cool. Um, at what, one of the hardest things in Rails is to introduce new object types. So Rails has three of them, basically. And introducing new ones is very difficult. So that's why these sorts of things don't really make it into Rails that much, because um, it's a trade-off. But in general, it's worth, if whatever code you're reading, it's worth looking at other code that's in the same space, solving similar problems in a different way. Uh, like I said, don't spend that much time reading copycats. Don't spend that much time reading things that are wildly different. Spend a lot of time looking, reading code that's similar to what you're doing. If you're building a real authentication plugin, read all the other real authentication plugins. You'll probably get some good ideas. Then, the, this is the part which doesn't apply at all to app developers, downstream. So this is where you make code and you're packaging it for other people. People will think of you as their upstream. And it's important to note, and this is sort of what Rails 3 was about, some of the people downstream from your app developers, some of the people downstream from your framework developers, right? So Rails historically has done a very good job at packaging up abstractions for app developers. People will be willing to look at Rails as a black box. We have historically done a very bad job at packaging up Rails for other framework developers. And the reason why, again, why I'm talking about framework developers as an archetype, as opposed to talking about framework developers as, I'm not talking about the person who wrote divide. Right? I'm talking about people who build Rails apps and occasionally want to do things that are more advanced. They want to do something that Rails didn't think of yet. Right? And Rails historically was too complicated for people like that to do useful things, so we ended up with a crazy land of monkey patching and people abusing Ruby to do the sorts of things that, um, if we were written in Java, would just be possible. Right? And the important thing to think about when you're packaging up your code for downstream is think about interfaces. So, um, Corey talked about this a little bit yesterday. Uh, there was a point in my programming career where I became exposed to the idea of interfaces, and it literally changed how I thought about everything forever. So uh, if you haven't heard about interfaces or like thought about how to program, I'm going to show you, give you some resources in a little bit. Like, Go read what I'm telling you to read. Um, so the important thing is that, in general, downstream interface, when you build an interface for downstream, the people downstream of you should be able to think of you as uh, something that exposes a few basic constructs. And in the case of Rails, we actually uh, used to be that we had like Rails and then Arrow, Rails users, right? And that worked okay, except that it meant that, for instance, our action path tests were like require active record, and then they were like doing stuff. And if somebody wanted to be like, actually, I would like to use Mongo instead, it was like a disaster. You were basically like using internal, oh, I guess new record question mark is a thing. I hope Rails doesn't change that because that's deeply coupled between all these components. So what Rails 3 did was we said, okay, there's actually interfaces. There's active model. This describes what it is to be a model. Um, we'll provide some implementation, but if you want to do your own, that's fine too. And action pack is just going to inherit, is going to basically beat downstream from that. So if you look at the action pack test today, when you do something like form for, it's actually not using active record. It's using a, what is essentially a mock, but it's an object that implements that interface, right? And then, uh, similarly downstream, right, we're providing, a fair, compared to the amount of methods that exist in Rails, a limited surface area. So, an app developer has your app, and uh, Corey did a good job of showing yesterday that when you only have your app, your tests are basically part of your app, and then you have ball of usage and you can't really test anything other than testing the entire thing. The first thing you want to do if you want to level up into framework developer land is to think of your tests as downstream from your app. So your app is providing an interface that your tests are consumers of. And then sort of the next level up and what we do a lot of at Strobe is you have your app and your tests are downstream from that but typically, um, and I think Pivotal does a lot of this too, your app, you have enough your apps that there are internal libraries that you want to use to share across things. So you want, instead of just building internal libraries and using the Rails 2 approach where you're building a, a big blob and you're like, we'll just hack in whatever we need and like, 
then you're like, oh, I have to talk to the team that builds that, and they release a new version and it breaks everything, right? Instead, you want the internal libraries to also behave as though they were frameworks, right? You want the internal libraries to have just exposed interfaces, well documented stuff. You want to be able to say, I'm expecting that when I call URL 4 on this library that we just designed internally, it, does the, it always does the thing I expect this to do. So, I think everyone would agree that what I just said is a good idea. Um, unfortunately, like I said, I also knew it was a good idea, but didn't actually know what it meant for the first several years I was programming. Um, I would read this book. Um, I don't know if the specific workflow of this book is exactly the workflow I would recommend, but it made me realize that there is like that there is an idea of an interface. There is there are objects and they have interfaces between each other, and that is the surface area that you care about. <coughs> so the important question that you ask yourself in general when you're building interfaces is where are the boundaries between my objects? And again, Corey talked about this a bunch yesterday. You have to figure out, it's not one big thing, which is a system. There are these objects and these objects, and what are the boundaries? How do the objects talk to each other? Framework development is all about those boundaries. And actually, my favorite uh, piece of writing about this topic is a post that Mark Graham wrote for his blog about Django. So he's a Turbo, Turbo Gears guy, and he was talking about coupling. So Django has this, um, this phrase called tightly integrated, loosely coupled. And Mark said, basically, I call bullshit. Um, he said, I'm, I'm hard on the Django folks here because I think the tightly integrated, loosely coupled buzz phrase is actually detrimental to understanding how the trade-offs work. And there are trade-offs, and those trade-offs mean there isn't and will never be one perfect web framework which somehow magically isn't subject to the downside of any of the constraints and design trade-offs that we all have to deal with every day. And that is basically, that, that blob is how I think about the problem, right? You, can, you can't actually say, we're going to make everything loosely coupled, every single method in its own class, right? That obviously does not work. And you cannot, you don't want to have a big blob. So deciding exactly where the boundaries are is a trade-off that you have to make all the time. And it's actually, that trade-off is actually the skill that you're good at when you're a framework developer, is thinking about how to make that trade-off. Um, I think some people think of it as a science, right? And I, they say, all you have to do is loosely couple everything. You follow this thing, you follow solid. And, no. follow it, right? and what I'm saying is it's actually an art. Um, it's very hard to figure out how to do it correctly. There's trade-offs every time you make an integration coupling decision, and figuring out how to do it is, is hard. If you isolate your concerns, make sure that you're isolating your concerns with interfaces. How are they communicating with each other? And I like to think about um, this in terms of escape velocity. Every time you isolate something, you're pushing complexity from the system that you have into the links between all the systems. So, uh, if we have too many isolated concerns at the same level of abstraction, we get the same complexity all over again. So imagine we have a big complex program. And we say, OK, this is a big complex program. It's too much complexity. We're going to break it up into nine or eight pieces. What sometimes can happen is that you end up with eight pieces that have too many boundaries between them. Right? It's too hard to reason about. So now you have two problems. right? Yeah. Uh, the right way to think about it, once you have more than a few pieces, is you have to build abstractions, right? So every few pieces gets its own abstraction, which is then the way that other abstractions talk to it. And this is actually hard, figuring out where the right place is to break apart the boundaries, figuring out where the objects are, where the groups of objects are, where the namespaces are, what the APIs are, how these, are these, are these arrows rest, are they inside of an object, are they some other thing, right? Figuring all that out is complicated, but, the, but you, it's important to not go too much to an extreme. You don't want to have 500 little circles that are connected to every single possible way, because then you're back to where you started from. You can't reason about it anymore. In fact, the, a bad, badly designed class is basically just what every single method is its own interface, and the communication is by a method argument, right? That's basically all it is. It's just you get too big, it gets too crazy, you want to break it up. So thankfully, Ruby has a lot of good tools for breaking things up and doing isolation, but there's not really any good answer for it. In general, the trade-off is about thinking about where the arrows are, right? how you are communicating. And I didn't show, like I said, I didn't show the big program is a lot of little arrows. But that basically what it is. So when you're a framework developer, basically what you're doing is you're building these abstractions. So the active model box is actually a, a little blob of isolated components that talk to each other that then exposes its own API down, right? So the important thing here is that active model exposes down the little circles inside of active model are talking to each other. So the active model components are coupled to each other but they're not coupled to the internals of each component, right? So 
We're building abstractions now. Um, and when you're building an app, right, same way. You have libraries. The libraries are allowed to be coupled. Um, again, Pivotal has, uh, I don't know if they still are doing desert, but they did this desert thing. It was OK that pieces of desert knew about each other, right? But what was, old, but what was important is that that abstraction down actually exposed something, one thing, right? And then every abstraction down exposed something. So how do you package for your downstream? How does that work? Uh, it's important to document your interfaces. So if you build a class, and the class has a few methods that are, uh, that are publicly available to other classes, make sure you document them. So first of all, document internally. And I don't only mean like document the method signatures. Here's, for instance, lookup context, which is a, probably a class that none of you ever heard of before right now. Um, actually, lookup context. And it tells you, like, lookup context is the object responsible for the whole the information required to look up templates, right? Um, and you basically want every single class that is there to encapsulate a concern inside of a bigger system, make sure that you have documented internally why it exists and what it is for. Also, if you're an open source project or a public project as opposed to a little project, you want to do a, a job of like another level of abstraction. So Jose wrote this great book called Crafting Rails Applications, which if you read through it, basically, yeah. <laughs> Um, so this could have been like Rails documentation, but it's very hard to write something of this length. Um, and basically it's like, why does lookup context exist? Why does the template resolver exist? What can we do with it? So every single chapter in the book is a way of taking some of the functionality that was exposed as an isolated component and doing something that is not the basic way that Rails works. I think it's a terrible title of it, but um, they didn't like Rails internally. Uh, in any event, you want, to, you want to document that. You want to make sure that when you write, you have isolated components, you describe what every little piece does, and you describe what the bigger system does, and why you design it the way you design it. So, at the end, I will tell you what I think you should do. What you should do is pick a side. Um, in general, you're either, you're either an app developer or you're a framework developer for any given piece of code you're writing. App developers, upstream pure abstraction. You have a bug, file a bug. That's it. Um, you spend all your time in your code, and there's no one downstream from you. Framework developers, you're a participant in the upstream discussion. If, some, if you try to use some part of Rails, try to extend some part of Rails, you have to be willing to participate. So this is this is what I'm saying. If you are, if you want to use Rails without having to participate in knowing how the internals work, writing patches and all that, just treat Rails as a pure abstraction. You want to monkey patch Rails, if you want to extend Rails, if you want to write plugins, you need to actually take the time to understand what's going on. Pick a side, right? Um, you should also spend a lot, a non-trivial amount of time reading other code. If you are writing code and you want to level up, essentially, read a lot of other code that's around the similar problem that you're working on. And if you want to be a framework developer and you write code, make sure that your abstractions are properly packaged and I should know, obviously, you will get better at this over time. I, when I started, I had no idea what I was doing. That's fine. I probably still don't have no idea what I'm doing. But you want to be, you want to be thinking about how to get better, right? You want, whoa. You know, about always how to get better at, uh, at what you're doing, and what I'm saying is if you want to improve your skills, come on. <laughs> if you want to improve your, your skills, one way to do it is to think more like a framework developer, and that means spending more time probably learning, understanding, thinking, helping other people fix their problems, thinking about people downstream from you. Um, as a, one, one big major difference between being an app developer and a framework developer is how much time you spend writing your own code. As a Rails developer, if you add up all the amount of time I've ever spent writing, uh, working on Rails, maybe 10% of the time or 5% of the time is writing code. 95% of the time is reading the Django book, going and looking at the bug tracker and figuring out why the abstractions are broken, trying to refactor things, right? So in general, if you want to be, uh, if you want to get better, probably going to spend Spend more time learning and less time. Thank you very much. <laughs>